Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles this morning, and I'm sure that you do, turn in them to John chapter 4. And quickly, uh, just a word from, about Matt Karsner. Um, if that was a dance instructor's promotional video, that was the worst thing I've ever seen. <laughs> you may not get a phone call. But for those of you wanting to go to Haiti, that was extraordinarily inspirational. I pray that you would... Seek God's wisdom and what he would have you to do there. John chapter 4, we're going to be in verse 46 through 54. And I'm going to ask if you're physically able to stand for the reading of the word. And so he came again to Cana in Galilee where he had made the water into wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And so Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go. Your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. And so he asked them the hour that he had began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that this was the hour that Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all of his household. And this was the second sign that Jesus had did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Let's pray together. Father God, I pray that the story here today, Lord, that you have given us will come alive. And that, Lord, we will see ourselves in it. And, Lord, that you will drive us to prayer. That we will see desperation in our lives. And that with whatever faith that we might have in this room, all of us different, all of us from one level to the next, but Lord God, that as we seek you, our faith will be made stronger. And as we seek you and hear from you, the more that we might believe and the more that others might, be, might believe through us. God, I do not possess the gifts of teaching and preaching. Those are heavenly. Those are things from you. I don't have them. So God, I ask you that you would grant them this morning and that I would receive them and that I would give the gifts that you have given and that they would be received with glory and honor to your son Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can be seated. It's an election year, and for a young politician, the Campaign trail must still be blazed. Babies need kissed. Signs need posted. Doors need to be knocked on. Volunteers need to be rallied. And votes still need to be secured. He has served two terms in the most tumultuous and rocky region in the city. He has been considered, though, one of the most promising young politicians in the area for recent years. His star is truly on the rise. One newspaper even did an article about his eventual rise all the way to the governor's mansion, perhaps. He is the poster child of politicians. His hair is combed just right. He wears designer suits to all the banquets. And in the streets, he wears jeans and rolls up his sleeves just right. Eight years ago, one of his top senior advisors had told him, it's about time for you to get you a pretty young debutante for a wife. 
We need to be able to present you as a family man with kids. And so the search began, and later that year, he met his wife at a campaign rally. She got, or he got his pretty little debutante, and she got her young politician and a foot in high society. It was a really sweet deal for both of them. They were content with the arrangement, and it wasn't long that they had their first child. It was a son, but at his birth, everything changed for this man. From the first time he held him, his heart began to change. He knew what love was for the first time, and it started to change him. He no longer worked long hours and took extended trips or scheduled late-night dinners with campaign or campaign donors, and he just loved to walk into his door right when he got off of work and see his little boy excitedly run in and say, Daddy's home, Daddy's home, Daddy's home, and jump into his arms. And when he was home, they were like peas and carrots. They played with each other. They made tents with each other. They ate snacks together. They watched sports together. He was absolutely crazy about his little boy. And his little boy was absolutely crazy about his dad, too. One Monday, the man returned from a two-day campaign trip. And his son, like always, come running up to greet him. But this time, his little boy had some wonderful news. He couldn't wait to tell his daddy. He jumped up in his daddy's lap and he was like, Daddy, Daddy, I got to tell you something. You're not going to believe what happened yesterday. I, it was, it was, I mean, it was, it was just, it was awesome. Oh, goodness, I don't know how I'm going to tell, tell you. And his dad said, look, buddy, calm down. He kind of chuckled with him and a smile. thought it was funny how excited he was. And he said, sit down here and we'll talk about it. He looks at his wife who is standing near the kitchen and she just gives a curious look but rolls her eyes and throws back her morning cocktail that was disguised in her coffee mug. But he grabs his little boy and sits him down in the breakfast nook chair and they begin to talk about this exciting news. What ha uh, well, 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 Daddy, uh, here's what happened. Saturday night, Mom let me spend the night over at Jonah's house. And that evening, his mama... She, she took us over to a wedding where she was helping out doing catering because, you know, she has to do that for extra money. And, and, and so anyway, we got to play when the, when the wedding was going on. It was awesome. We just played the whole time. It was a big party. It was so much fun. And the party was lasting so long and so late into the night that Jonah's mama said, listen, guys, we're just going to have to camp out here. We get to sleep out here tonight. So we got to sleep outside by the fire and roast marshmallows, and it was awesome. The dad says, well, man, buddy, that does sound great. He said, no, 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 dad. That's not what's so exciting. That's not the best part. When we were out by the campfire, there was this man who came out, and he sat down, and he told us story after story after story, stories about heaven and about God. It was almost like he had been there, and I could have listened to him all night, daddy, and he was just the nicest man. He had such good, just good, he was so sweet. And daddy, here's what happened. The next morning when we were walking back, Jonah's mama told us, that in the middle of that party, those people, they ran out of wine. And it was going to be embarrassing. And then this, this man called her and the other servants over who was helping. And, and he said, hey, put the water in these jars. And you know what happened, Daddy? When Jonah's mom poured that water out into those guest cups, that water had turned into wine. Jonah's mama said she had never seen nothing like it in her life and never would ever again probably. John's mama said that this man was a miracle worker and claimed that he was, he was even God. But daddy, if I knew he could do stuff like that, I think I would ask him to do something for me maybe. Well, son, man, this really does sound great. This man sounds extraordinary. This, this is, this is, this is uh, oh, daddy, he was. he was. He was awesome. Maybe someday we can meet him. Maybe someday you, you can call him into your office. Well, maybe so, son. What was his name? And his little son looked at him and said, I believe his name was Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, immediately, the father looks up at his wife and they catch each other's eyes. Jesus was a person that he and his staff had been discussing recently. Jesus was a person that had caused quite a frenzy in his region. Many reports had come in of Jesus' radical teaching, of his powerful preaching, and claims of miracles and healings all over the place. One of his staffers who had been set out to check this Jesus out came back totally changed by what he had seen and what he had heard. Their office had not made an official statement about this Jesus yet, but they would soon have to if it continued to grow. And what's more, the Senate had already been meeting privately to see what they could do with this Jesus and perhaps have him arrested or worse. So something had to be done. But Daddy, Daddy, if, if we get to meet him, if you get to meet Jesus, will you let me come too? Can I, can I come to your office too? And his dad was so moved by his son's enthusiasm and excitement, he just scooped him up for a big hug and said, Come on, boy. I ain't seen you in a couple of days. Let's, let's play some hide-and-go-seek. But that night, when the little fellow went to sleep, 
he walked into the kitchen. He was going to grab a snack before bed, and there his wife stood at the counter. She was sipping her late-night toddy. And he pulls the refrigerator door open, and he looks over at her, and he says, how many of those things have you had today? She doesn't reply. She's heard that before. To avoid the conversation, though, he just changes the subject. And he says, what about all that stuff he was talking about today? What about that stuff he was rattling off about, about over there at the wedding? She looks at him with a snarl and says, and you know that you need to talk to him about that. And we never need to let him go over to that Jonah's house again. Come on now. What are you talking about? It sounds a bit harsh, don't you? He loves Jonah, and he loves Jonah's mama, too. Yeah, I know he loves Jonah, and I know he loves Jonah's mom, too. But I don't like him being exposed to that kind of stuff. And it might not be good for us right now. You know, we have a campaign to win, remember? Now, listen, that can't be. How can this be such a bad thing for our campaign? Besides, I'm more worried about the opposition or the media finding out how many of those things you toss back every night than I am about him going over to Jonah's house. By the way, wasn't it your idea to let him be Jonah's friend in the first place? Remember, you said it was good PR for him to hang out with those people like that and to be friendly with the poor. It would look good for our public relations. I think you called them trailer trash in private. Yeah, you're right. I did say that. And I've done a whole lot of other things to secure your public relations over the years, haven't I? See, she had hidden and covered up multiple instances of his infidelity. But she looks at him and says, mark my words. If he starts to believe in this religious garbage, it can hurt us. And you've said it before that this stuff is just only for the poor and ignorant. They believe in stuff like healings and fairy tales of miracles and a promise of a better future. And I, for one, don't want our son believing in junk like that. You know as well as I do that this Jesus guy is probably a religious nut and we need to keep him away from him. Well, it sounds like you actually might be concerned for our son a little bit. She stands at the bar and she grabs her glass and with her freshly manicured finger, she points over at him and she says, listen here, yeah, I do care. I care more about that little fellow than you ever know. But I'm telling you this, if he goes around and he starts talking about this guy, Jesus, to his teachers and friends, I promise you a reporter's going to hear and they're going to ask you at some point what you think about this water into wine man and you better have an answer ready for him. Deal with this now or we might lose votes. She turns and she goes off to her bedroom and he turns and goes off to his. But before he goes to sleep, he considers what his wife had said. She may be a lot of things and she may not be some things, but her political prowess has always been dead on. He knows he needs to consider it. So the next morning he walks into the kitchen and his little boy's there eating cereal and he's drawing a picture and he says, what you drawing there, buddy? Picture of Jesus, daddy. Oh no. He walks over and sits down beside him. He says, let me see that. And he glances over at a stick figure holding some water pots. Oh, man, that's good, bud. That looks real good. You can draw so well. Is this Jesus here with the water pots? Yep, sure he is. Well, that's good, son. His wife walks into the kitchen and opens the fridge, and she just looks over at him and gives, you this, gives him this I told you so look. He says, hey, bud, listen to me. I want you to do something. I thought your story about this man was great, and this wedding must be awesome. You talking about Jesus? Yes, Jesus. This, this guy is awesome, but here, I, I need you to do something for me for, uh, for a little while, buddy. Can you just keep this a secret? Don't tell anybody, at least until I can meet this man. Your mom and I discussed it, and we think that it's just best that we don't say anything about him right now to people. Until, just until I get a chance to meet him. I promise I will. He rubs the little boy's head. And says, is that okay? And he says, yeah, sure, Dad. And he goes off to work, and the little boy goes off to school. Well, on Friday of that week, the dad came home from work, and he opens the door. This time, it's a little bit different. His son did not come running in to him, as usual. And he calls for him, but there's no answer. He calls for his wife, but there no one comes. As he walks into the kitchen, he puts his keys on the counter, and his wife comes in. She's hurried in from the direction of the boy room, boy's room. She has a damp white cloth in her hand, and a look of fright is on her face. She takes the cloth to the sink to soak it with water once more. What's the matter with you, he says. It's not me, it's our son. Something is wrong with him. He came home from school early today. He's sick, he's very sick. What is it? I don't know. It seems like the flu because it came on so sudden. But he, come home and he came home and he said that he was tired. And you know that's not like him. He wanted to take a nap. And when he went in to take a nap, the maid went in and checked on him and to get his clothes. And she put her hand on his forehead and she noticed it was a terrible fever. So together, the man and the wife, they walk down to his room. And he sits on the edge of the bed and says, little buddy, you feeling bad? The little boy just shakes his head. He can't muster the energy to speak. 
Well, listen here. You just rest for a while and you let your dad take care of you. Sounds like you might have the flu. We'll get you some medicine. And I promise we'll be in the backyard playing football before Sunday. The boy smiles. And his dad just rubs his head. And for a few minutes, and after a few minutes, the little boy goes back to sleep. While in the room, his wife looks over and says, I'm really worried about him. Something's wrong. This is not right. Oh, goodness. It's just a cold or the flu. It's no big deal. Just in a couple of days, make sure he's just rest and he'll be better. No, this is different, she says. Call it a mother's intuition. Well, you'd have to be a mother to have mother's intuition, he says sarcastically. Look here, she says earnestly. I may not be the best mother. I may not even be a good one, but I am one. And I love that little fella as much as you do. And I'm telling you, something is not right. Something is not right. Just give it till morning, he says. She says, call a doctor now or I will. Reluctantly, he picks up the phone, and an hour later, the doctor comes over. The boy is still asleep when the doctor gets there, and he leans down beside the boy and opens his bag. He puts his hand on the boy's forehead, and immediately he is alarmed. He attempts to wake the boy, but the boy doesn't respond. How long has he been like this? He takes the stethoscope out, and he starts to apply and listen. The mother said, just since, just since this afternoon. The doctor says, well, maybe, maybe we've caught it in time. What do you mean, caught what in time, the dad says? Well, there's a mysterious and extremely dangerous virus that's been going around. In our town alone, it has killed three adults so far. And we must act fast. We can't even uh, transport him to the hospital. We have to do this right now. It's too much risk for us to try to do anything other. What? His dad asked in shock. There's no way this could be happening. The doctor said, no, it is. And I'm telling you, we have to do everything right now from here. Just leave me alone and let me tend to him. What can I do? This guy says nothing. And as the night wears on, the boy's condition worsens and worsens and worsens. And by morning, the doctor walks in and he says to his dad what every parent never wants to hear. I am sorry. I have done all that I can do. This can't be. There's no way. We've got to do something. We've got to do something. Do something. The dad walks out of the room and down to the hallway where friends and family and his staff has gathered. He staggers through the hallway into his wife's room when he finds her weeping face down on the bed. He tells her what the doctor has said. And as they sit on the edge of the bed together, they just cry. He puts his head in his hands and through his fingers and his tears, he looks around the room and he notices that there are papers lying all over the floor and all over the bed. He said, what is all this? It's his drawings, things that he had done from school over the years. I've kept all of them. The dad fumbles through a few of them and out of his one eye, he catches... The picture the little boy was drawing while eating cereal a few days earlier of Jesus in the water pots. He frantically shoves all the drawings aside and he grabs it, he clutches it in his fist and he remembered that the wedding was just over in Cana. He quickly gets up from the bed and he rushes out of the room. His wife says, where are you going? He says, I have to find him. Find who? I have to find him, pointing at the man in the picture. And it was in this moment of desperation that the spark of faith was ignited in his heart and it moved his feet into action. It was in this moment that the mustard seed of his soul was cracked and this tiny bit of faith and a huge love for his son made him run out the door and toward Cana. It's 20 miles to Cana, a four mile or four hour run uphill. He had traveled this road thousands of times on the campaign trail. And along this road, hundreds of people had come to him in desperation, seeking the man of power and influence, seeking the one that can do something that's out of their control. But now the roles have been reversed. He is seeking the only one who is powerful and everything is out of his control. What a humbling experience for a man of such status. And you would think it was a lonely road that he was walking on, but it wasn't wasn't a lonely road. The road of faith is never lonely. Doubts walk beside him all along the way. Turn back and go home. This is stupid. You're a man of action. Do something. This is nothing going to this man. Get a better doctor, not a preacher. That's what you need. This is dumb. You're a man of high influence. What will your contributors think? The governor is going to pull his endorsement. And besides all of this, you should be railing at God instead of running to him. But none of these doubts deterred him. He kept on moving toward Jesus and toward what his son had wanted. It was in times like this that he realized he was smart enough to know that you can't rely on what organizations, government, or money can do. In these times, you must rely on only what God can do. And when he arrives in Cana, he inquires about the whereabouts of Jesus. Where is he? 
They quickly point over to a few streets over where there is a, scout, a crowd gathered. He bumps and nudges and wedges his way in through the crowd and drenched with sweat and out of breath, he grabs Jesus' arm and says to him, you must come back to my house and heal my son. But Jesus doesn't budge. Please come with me, sir. My little boy is very sick. He's near the point of death. Please, I beg you, come. Unless you people see signs of wonders, you will not believe. The response was very strange. It was unexpected and it was seemingly harsh. But however, to this man, it was more like a test. It was more like a call. Yes, this Jesus was calling him into a deeper, a deeper belief, calling him into a deeper faith, calling him into a deeper need that he had, calling him into a deeper reality, calling him into a deeper understanding of who this Jesus of Nazareth truly was. And even though he was exhausted from his journey and he was tired, Jesus was bidding him, come one more step, please. One more step. And this man knew that Jesus had something more in mind for him. And if this man could take the next step, unlike all those miracle-seeking crowds, that it would be a glorious step and it would be a life-altering step. And he takes it. He has come this far and with great pleading, he looks at him and he says, Sir, come down before my child dies. And what he said here was a deeper Thing. It was deeper than a desperate demand for a dying child. It was a high dive into the divine. And there in the middle of a crowded street, in the midst of this chaos with all these people, there was a quiet moment and this man in Jesus' eyes met. And he sees what his son had saw by the campfire that night. He sees the compassion, the kindness, the mercy, and the love that was alive inside of this Jesus of Nazareth. He saw what the water at the wedding of Canaan sought when it blushed. He saw his master. And the words that came out of Jesus' mouth he will never forget next was, Go, your son will live. Because he had took the one more step, Jesus sends him a step further. As a politician, he had made many promises to many people that he had never kept. He had said many things that he had never intended to keep. And his words were bound by budgets and tape. But he learned to never trust anyone and never trust anything from the lips of another human being. But something was different about this man from Nazareth. This Nazarene was no human. He was no mere man. He could be trusted and his words were bound by nothing. He could be taking at his word because he was the word. And because he was truth, because he understood this, the tears of deepest sorrow and anguish turned to unspeakable joy in that moment. His hands that were folded in earnest prayer were now turned to palms raised in praise. The words of Jesus had now watered the mustard seed of his heart and it had cracked and was thriving into a plant that was reaching out. This man turns calmly and walks toward home. Yes, that's what the text reports. For it says that his sermons came to inform him that yesterday at the seventh hour the fever had left him. Do you understand what happens? This man did not hurry home to his son. In fact, he stayed the night in Cana. He stayed there. Why? It's because he now travels with peace. He now travels with confidence. He now has a confidence in his walk. He does not need to run home and see the great sign and miracle before he, uh, because he has already seen the great sign and heard the great miracle. When he arrives at home, his little boy runs in, throws his arms around him, and he says, Son, guess who I met yesterday? His wife sees him and tears flow down her face. And for the first time in years, they lovingly embrace. And he pleads for her, pleads with her to forgive him for his cutting sarcasm and a loveless marriage. He calls all those present to the home that are gathered there in the living room. They sit in the center of the room and with his little boy on his knee, he looks up and he says, you all may be wondering what has happened and why my son has recovered. And he stands and says, Jesus is why my son is alive. At the very moment he spoke it, it came into being. And at this, he and himself believed and all of his household. All of faith starts somewhere. No matter how small it is, no matter what drives us there, faith begins somewhere. Prayer helps our faith grow. 
Prayer involves us seeing something that we have not seen. Sometimes desperate circumstances cause us to run to God instead of rail against him. Prayer helps us walk this life in confidence. Prayer is much more than us seeking an answer than it is about us seeking him. Prayer is more than our desperate demands in our life. Prayer is us diving into the divine. Prayer must be more about us coming to Jesus with whatever little faith we have and him asking us to come one more step further. Come down, sir, so that my son will live. Have you ever prayed that? Have you ever prayed this? Come down, sir, so that I might live. If you ever pray that prayer, I promise you the answer is this. Jesus says, I did. I came down. I came down that lonely road myself. And I went to that cross and I died so that you might have life and that you might have life everlasting. If you're in here this morning and you have a little bit of faith that this Jesus is who he says he is with whatever it came by, whether it was the sermon of some little preacher somewhere or whether it was something on a little refrigerator somewhere that you've seen a drawing, whatever it is, that faith is enough to make you step out. And he'll bid you each day come a little step further. Caleb's going to come now. We're going to enter into a time of response to this. I thank God that he has shown us stories like the story of this official son that lets us know that no matter who we are and where we are, that we are desperate and that we need to dive into the divine, dive into God in prayer. We came out of the series, James. And James is all about faith working, isn't it? The greatest work you'll ever do to prove your faith is to pray. It's to pray. While Caleb plays this morning, I'm going to ask you to do a few things. Husbands, if you're here with your wives, I want you to grab their hands and I want you to pray with them. If you're here with your families, if you're fortunate enough for that, then I want you to grab your families and I want you to pray. You can come to the altar, you can sit where you are, you can do whatever you need to do. If you're here this morning and you're alone and you need to come and talk with somebody, then you come down here, we'll have people at the front that you can pray with, that you can ask things about. If you just want to come and you just want to be with God yourself and just pray to Him, take that step of faith. Walk out there and listen to him ask you to come a little step further. Maybe the greatest thing you've ever done. Before he spoke creation.